Supernatural Horror in Literature by H. P. Lovecraft. Chapter Nine: The Weird Tradition in the British Isles. Recent British literature, besides including the three or four greatest fantasists of the present age, has been gratifyingly fertile in the element of the weird. Rudyard Kipling has often approached it and has, despite the omnipresent mannerisms, handled it with indubitable mastery in such tales as The Phantom Rickshaw, The Finest Story in the World, The Recrudescence of Imre, and The Mark of the Beast. This latter is of particular poignancy. The pictures of the naked leper priest who mewed like an otter, of the spots which appeared on the chest of the man that priest cursed, of the growing carnivorousness of the victim, and of the fear which horses began to display toward him, and of the eventually half-accomplished transformation of that victim into a leopard, being things which no reader is ever likely to forget. The final defeat of the malignant sorcery does not impair the force of the tale, or the validity of its mastery. Lafcadio Hearn, strange, wandering, and exotic, departs still farther from the realm of the real, and with the supreme artistry of a sensitive poet, weaves fantasies impossible to an author of the solid roast beef type. His Fantastics, written in America, contains some of the most impressive ghoulishness in all literature, whilst his Quaidan, written in Japan, crystallizes with matchless skill and delicacy. The eerie lore and whispered legends of that richly colourful nation. Still more of Hearn's wizardry of language is shown in some of his translations from the French, especially from Gautier and Flaubert. His version of the latter's Temptation of St. Anthony is a classic of fevered and riotous imagery, clad in the magic of singing words. Oscar Wilde may likewise be given a place amongst weird writers, both for certain of his exquisite fairy tales, and for his vivid picture of Dorian Gray, in which a marvellous portrait for years assumes the duty of ageing and coarsening instead of its original, who meanwhile plunges into every excess of vice and crime, without the outward loss of youth, beauty, and freshness. There is a sudden and potent climax when Dorian Gray, at last become a murderer, seeks to destroy the painting whose changes testify to his moral degeneracy. He stabs it with a knife, and a hideous cry and crash are heard. But when the servants enter, they find it in all its pristine loveliness. Lying on the floor was a dead man, in evening dress, with a knife in his heart. He was withered, wrinkled, and loathsome of visage. It was not until they had examined the rings that they recognized who he was. Matthew Phipps Scheel, author of many weird, grotesque, and adventurous novels and tales, occasionally attains a high level of horrific magic. Zeluca is a notoriously hideous fragment, but is excelled by Mr. Scheel's undoubted masterpiece, The House of Sounds, floridly written in the yellow nineties, and recast with more artistic restraint in the early twentieth century. This story, in final form, deserves a place amongst the foremost things of its kind. It tells of a creeping horror and menace trickling down the centuries on a sub-arctic island off the coast of Norway, where, amidst the sweep of demon winds and the ceaseless din of hellish waves and cataracts, a vengeful dead man built a brazen tower of terror. It is vaguely like, yet infinitely unlike, Poe's fall of the House of Usher. In the novel The Purple Cloud, Mr. Scheel describes with a tremendous power a curse which came out of the Arctic to destroy mankind, and which for a time appears to have left but a single inhabitant on our planet. The sensations of the lone survivor as he realizes his position, and roams through the corpse-littered and treasure-strewn cities of the world as their absolute master, are delivered with a skill and artistry falling little short of actual majesty. Unfortunately, the second half of the book, with its conventionally romantic element, involves a distinct letdown. Better known than Scheele is the ingenious Bram Stoker, who created many starkly horrific conceptions in a series of novels whose poor technique sadly impairs their net effect. The Lair of the White Worm, dealing with a giant primitive entity that lurks in a vault beneath an ancient castle, 
utterly ruins a magnificent idea by a development almost infantile. The jewel of seven stars, touching on a strange Egyptian resurrection, is less crudely written. But best of all is the famous Dracula, which has become almost the standard modern exploitation of the frightful vampire myth. Count Dracula, a vampire, dwells in a horrible castle in the Carpathians, but finally migrates to England with the design of populating the country with fellow vampires. How an Englishman fares within Dracula's stronghold of terrors, and how the dead fiend's plot for domination is at last defeated, are elements which unite to form a tale now justly assigned a permanent place in English letters. Dracula evoked many similar novels of supernatural horror among which the best are perhaps The Beetle by Richard Marsh, Brood of the Witch Queen by Sax Romer, Arthur Sarsfield Ward, and The Door of the Unreal by Gerald Bliss. The latter handles quite dexterously the standard werewolf superstition. Much subtler and more artistic, and told with singular skill through the juxtaposed narratives of the several characters, is the novel Cold Harbour by Francis Brett Young, in which an ancient house of strange malignity is powerfully delineated. The mocking and well nigh omnipotent fra The mocking and well nigh omnipotent fiend Humphrey Furnival holds echoes of the Manfred Montoni type of early Gothic villain, but is redeemed from triteness by many clever individualities. Only the slight diffuseness of explanation at the close and the somewhat too free use of divination as a plot factor keep this tale from approaching absolute perfection. In the novel Witchwood, John Buchan depicts with tremendous force a survival of the evil Sabbat in a lonely district of Scotland. The description of the black forest with the evil stone, and of the terrible cosmic adumbrations when the horror is finally extirpated, will repay one for wading through the very gradual action and plethora of Scottish dialect. Some of Mr. Buchan's short stories are also extremely vivid in their spectral intimations. The Green Wildebeest, a tale of African witchcraft. The Wind in the Portico, with its awakening of dead Britano-Roman horrors, and School Scary, with its touches of sub-Arctic fright, being especially remarkable. Clement's Houseman, in the brief novelette The Werewolf, attains a high degree of gruesome tension and achieves to some extent the atmosphere of authentic folklore. In The Elixir of Life, Arthur Ransom attains some darkly excellent effects despite a general naivety of plot, while H. B. Drake's The Shadowy Thing summons up strange and terrible vistas. George MacDonald's Lilith has a compelling bizarrerie all its own, the first and simpler of the two versions being perhaps the most effective. Deserving of distinguished notice as a forceful craftsman, to whom an unseen mystic world is ever a close and vital reality, is the poet Walter de la Mer, whose haunting verse and exquisite prose alike bear consistent traces of a strange vision reaching deeply into veiled spheres of beauty and terrible and forbidden dimensions of being. In the novel The Return, we see the soul of a dead man reach out of its grave of two centuries and fasten itself upon the flesh of the living, so that even the face of the victim becomes that which had long ago returned to dust. Of the shorter tales, of which several volumes exist, many are unforgettable for their command of fears and sorcery's darkest ramifications. Notably, Seton's Aunt, in which there lowers a noxious background of malignant vampirism. The Tree, which tells of a frightful vegetable growth in the yard of a starving artist. Out of the Deep, wherein we are given leave to imagine what thing answered the summons of a dying wastrel in a dark, lonely house, when he pulled a long-feared bell-cord in the attic of his dread-haunted boyhood. A Recluse, which hints at what sent a chance guest flying from a house in the night. Mr. Kemper which shows us a mad clerical hermit in quest of the human soul, dwelling in a frightful sea-cliff region beside an archaic abandoned chapel, and All Hallows, a glimpse of demoniac forces besieging a lonely medieval church and miraculously restoring the rotting masonry. De La Mer does not make fear the soul or even the dominant element of most of his tales, being apparently more interested in the subtleties of character involved. 
occasionally he sinks to sheer whimsical fantasy of the barry order still he is among the very few to whom unreality is a vivid living presence and as such he is able to put into his occasional fear studies a keen potency which only a rare master can achieve his poem the listeners restores the gothic shudder to modern verse the weird short story has fared well of late an important contributor being the versatile e f benson whose the man who went too far breathes whisperingly of a house at the edge of a dark wood and of pan's hoofmark on the breast of a dead man mr benson's volume visible and invisible contains several short stories of singular power notably negotium perambulans whose unfolding reveals an abnormal monster from an ancient ecclesiastical panel which performs an act of miraculous vengeance in a lonely village on the cornish coast and the horror horn through which lopes a terrible half-human survival dwelling on unvisited alpine peaks the face in another collection is lethally potent in its relentless aura of doom h r wakefield in his collection they return at evening and others who return manages now and then to achieve great heights of horror despite a vitiating air of sophistication the most notable stories are the red lodge with its slimy aqueous evil he cometh and he passeth by and he shall sing the ken look up there blind man's buff and that bit of lurking millennial horror the seventeenth hole at doncaster mention has been made of the weird work of h g wells and a conan doyle the former in the ghost of fear reaches a very high level while all the items in thirty strange stories have strong fantastic implications doyle now and then struck a powerfully spectral note as in the captain of the pole star a tale of arctic ghostliness and lot number two four nine wherein the reanimated mummy theme is used with more than ordinary skill hugh walpole of the same family as the founder of gothic fiction has sometimes approached the bizarre with much success his short story mrs lunt carrying a very poignant shudder john metcalf in the collection published as the smoking leg attains now and then a rare pitch of potency the tale entitled the bad lands containing graduations of horror that strongly savour of genius more whimsical and inclined toward the amiable and innocuous fantasy of sir j m barry are the short tales of e m forster grouped under the title of the celestial omnibus of these only one dealing with a glimpse of pan and his aura of fright may be said to hold the true element of cosmic horror mrs h d everett though adhering to very old and conventional models occasionally reaches singular heights of spiritual terror in her collection of short stories the death mask l p hartley is notable for his incisive and extremely ghastly tale a visitor from down under may sinclair's uncanny stories contain more of traditional occultism than of that creative treatment of fear which marks mastery in this field and are inclined to lay more stress on human emotions and psychological delving than upon the stark phenomena of a cosmos utterly unreal it may be well to remark here that occult believers are probably less effective than materialists in delineating the spectral and the fantastic since to them the phantom world is so commonplace a reality that they tend to refer to it with less awe remoteness and impressiveness than do those who see in it an absolute and stupendous violation of the natural order of rather uneven stylistic quality but vast occasional power in its suggestion of lurking worlds and beings behind the ordinary surface of life is the work of william hope hodgson known to-day far less than it deserves to be despite a tendency towards conventionally sentimental conceptions of the universe and of man's relation to it and to his fellows mr hodgson is perhaps second only to algernon blackwood in his serious treatment of unreality few can equal him in adumbrating the nearness of nameless forces and monstrous besieging entities through casual hints and insignificant details 
or in conveying feelings of the spectral and the abnormal in connection with regions or buildings. In The Boats of Glen Carrig, 1907, we are shown a variety of malign marvels and accursed unknown lands as encountered by the survivors of a sunken ship. The brooding menace in the earlier parts of the book is impossible to surpass, though a let-down in the direction of ordinary romance and adventure occurs toward the end. An inaccurate and pseudo-romantic attempt to reproduce 18th-century prose detracts from the general effect. But the really profound nautical erudition everywhere displayed is a compensating factor. The House on the Borderland, 1908, perhaps the greatest of all Mr. Hodgson's works, tells of a lonely and evilly regarded house in Ireland which forms a focus for hideous otherworld forces and sustains a siege by blasphemous hybrid anomalies from a hidden abyss below. The wandering of the narrator's spirit through limitless light years of cosmic space and culpers of eternity, and its witnessing of the solar system's final destruction, constitute something almost unique in standard literature, and everywhere there is manifest the author's power to suggest vague, ambushed horrors in natural scenery. But for a few touches of commonplace sentimentality, this book would be a classic of the first water. The Ghost Pirates 1909, regarded by Mr. Hodgson as rounding out a trilogy with the two previously mentioned works, is a powerful account of a doomed and haunted ship on its last voyage, and of the terrible sea devils, of quasi-human aspect and perhaps the spirits of bygone buccaneers, that besiege it and finally drag it down to an unknown fate. With its command of maritime knowledge, and its clever selection of hints and incidents suggestive of latent horrors in nature, this book at times reaches enviable peaks of power. The Nightland, 1912, is a long extended, 538 pages, tale of the Earth's infinitely remote future, billions of billions of years ahead, after the death of the Sun. It is told in a rather clumsy fashion, as the dreams of a man in the seventeenth century, whose mind merges with its own future incarnation, and is seriously marred by painful verboseness, repetitiousness, artificial and nauseously sticky romantic sentimentality, and an attempt at archaic language even more grotesque and absurd than that in Glen Carrig. Allowing for all its faults, it is yet one of the most potent pieces of macabre imagination ever written. The picture of a night-black, dead planet, with the remains of the human race concentrated in a stupendously vast mental pyramid, and besieged by monstrous, hybrid, and altogether unknown forces of the darkness, is something that no reader can ever forget. Shapes and entities of an altogether non-human and inconceivable sort, the prowlers of the black, man-forsaken, and unexplored world outside the pyramid, are suggested and partly described with ineffable potency, while the night landscape, with its chasms and slopes and dying volcanism, takes on an almost sentient terror beneath the author's touch. Midway in the book, the central figure ventures outside the pyramid on a quest through death-haunted realms untrod by man for millions of years, and in his slow, minutely described, day-by-day -day progress over unthinkable leagues of immemorial blackness, there is a sense of cosmic alienage, breathless mystery, and terrified expectancy unrivalled in the whole range of literature. The last quarter of the book drags woefully, but fails to spoil the tremendous power of the whole. Mr. Hodgson's later volume, Carnacki the Ghost Finder, consists of several longish short stories published many years before in magazines. In quality it falls conspicuously below the level of the other books. We here find a more or less conventional stock figure of the infallible detective type, the progeny of Monsieur Dupin and Sherlock Holmes, and the close kin of Algernon Blackwood's John Silence moving through scenes and events badly marred by an atmosphere of professional occultism. A few of the episodes, however, are of undeniable power and afford glimpses of the peculiar genius characteristic of the author. 
Naturally, it is impossible in brief sketch to trace out all the classic modern uses of the terror element. The ingredient must of necessity enter into all work, both prose and verse, treating broadly of life, and we are therefore not surprised to find a share in such writers as the poet Browning, whose Child Roland to the Dark Tower came, is instinct with hideous menace, or the novelist Joseph Conrad, who often wrote of the dark secrets within the sea, and of the demoniac driving power of fate as influencing the lives of lonely and maniacally resolute men. Its trail is one of infinite ramifications, but we must here confine ourselves to its appearance in a relatively unmixed state, where it determines and dominates the work of art containing it. Somewhat separate from the main British stream is that current of weirdness in Irish literature which came to the fore in the Celtic Renaissance of the later 19th and early 20th centuries. Ghost and fairy lore have always been of great prominence in Ireland, and for over a hundred years have been recorded by a line of such faithful transcribers and translators as William Carlton, T. Crofton Croker, Lady Wilde, mother of Oscar Wilde, Douglas Hyde and W. B. Yeats. Brought to notice by the modern movement, this body of myth has been carefully collected and studied, and its salient features reproduced in the works of later figures like Yeats, J. M. Singe, A. E., Lady Gregory, Patrick Collum, James Stevens, and their colleagues. Whilst on the whole, more whimsically fantastic than terrible, such folklore and its consciously artistic counterparts contain much that falls truly within the domain of cosmic horror. Tales of burials in sunken churches beneath haunted lakes, accounts of death-heralding banshees and sinister changelings, ballads of spectres and the unholy creatures of the wraths, all these have their poignant and definite shivers and mark a strong and distinctive element in weird literature. Despite homely grotesqueness and absolute naivete, there is genuine nightmare in the class of narrative represented by the yarn of Tigo Cain, who, in punishment for his wild life, was ridden all night by a hideous corpse that demanded burial, and drove him from churchyard to churchyard, as the dead rose up, loathsomely in each one, and refused to accommodate the newcomer with a berth. Yeats, undoubtedly the greatest figure of the Irish revival, if not the greatest of all living poets, has accomplished notable things, both in original work and in the codification of old legends. <laughs>